In the Bible, Mary Magdalene is mentioned only once in the Gospels until the very end of Jesus' life. In Luke 8, 1 through 3, Mary and some other women are following Jesus and the apostles on a preaching tour. The authors of the Urantia book tell us that this group of women was a women's evangelistic core Jesus formed to minister to other women. The other biblical mentions of Mary Magdalene are in connection with the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. The recent book by Dan Brown, The Da Vinci Code, speaks of Jesus and Mary Magdalene as being married with children. There is no evidence of such a relationship in the Bible or any of their Urantia papers, but the Gospel of Philip, one of the apocryphal Gnostic writings found at Nag Hammadi, does mention contact between Jesus and Mary Magdalene that could be seen as brotherly or otherwise. On the basis of this single, probably fictional account has been built a mountain of speculation involving marriage and children. Considering Jesus' dual nature, being both human and divine, and how he saw his mission in life, it seems implausible that Jesus had an intimate relationship with any woman. The portrayal of Mary Magdalene as a prostitute has been a bone of contention for Christian theologians for centuries. The only hint of Mary's possible unfortunate background is in the name of her home city, Magdala. Some researchers feel that this city could have been a resort with a bad reputation. The authors of the Urantia book tell us that Mary Magdalene was rescued from an unsavory life by the women's corps that Jesus had organized. Here is the story of the conversion of Mary from paper 150. It was at Magdala that the women first demonstrated their usefulness and vindicated the wisdom of their choosing. Andrew had imposed rather strict rules upon his associates about doing personal work with women, especially with those of questionable character. When the party entered Magdala, these ten women evangelists were free to enter the evil resorts and preach the glad tidings directly to all their inmates. And when visiting the sick, these women were able to draw very close in their ministry to their afflicted sisters. As the result of the ministry of these ten women, afterward known as the twelve women, at this place, Mary Magdalene was one for the kingdom. Through a succession of misfortunes and in consequence of the attitude of reputable society toward women who commit such errors of judgment, this woman had found herself in one of the nefarious resorts of Magdala. It was Martha and Rachel who made plain to Mary that the doors of the kingdom were open to even such as she. Mary believed the good news and was baptized by Peter the next day. Mary Magdalene became the most effective teacher of the gospel among this group of twelve women evangelists. She was set apart for such service, together with Rebecca at Jatapata about four weeks subsequent to her conversion. Mary and Rebecca, with the others of this group, went on through the remainder of Jesus' life on earth, laboring faithfully and effectively for the enlightenment and uplifting of their downtrodden sisters. And when the last and tragic episode in the drama of Jesus' life was being enacted, notwithstanding the apostles all fled but one, these women were all present, and not one either denied or betrayed him. Unquote. Mary Magdalene reappears at the crucifixion, where she stands with the other women witnessing Jesus dying on the cross. She appears again at the empty tomb where Jesus had been laid to his final rest. Mary and some other women went to the tomb to more thoroughly anoint and wrap Jesus' body. When Mary Magdalene discovers Jesus' body is missing, she gives out a cry and the other women flee, but they soon return and Mary tells them that Jesus' body is gone. As they are pondering this development, someone appears to them. In paper 189, the authors tell us, as these women sat there in the early hours of the dawn of this new day, they looked to one side and observed a silent and motionless stranger. For a moment they were again frightened, 
but Mary Magdalene rushed toward him, and addressing him as if she thought he might be the caretaker of the garden, said, Where have you taken the master? Where have they laid him? Tell us that we may go and get him. When the stranger did not answer Mary, she began to weep. Then spoke Jesus to them, saying, Whom do you seek? Mary said, We seek for Jesus, who was laid to rest in Joseph's tomb, but he is gone. Do you know where they have taken him? Then said Jesus, Did not this Jesus tell you, even in Galilee, that he would die, but that he would rise again? These words startled the women, but the master was so changed that they did not yet recognize him with his back turned to the dim light. And as they pondered his words, he addressed the Magdalene with a familiar voice, saying, Mary. And when she heard that word of well-known sympathy and affectionate greeting, she knew it was the voice of the master, and she rushed to kneel at his feet while she exclaimed, My Lord and my master. And all of the other women recognized that it was the master who stood before them in glorified form and then quickly knelt before him. Unquote. These events are also described in the Bible in Matthew 28, 1-10, as well as in Mark 16, 1-8, Luke 23, 55, through Luke 24, 10, and John 20, 1-10. According to the authors, Mary is present several other times when Jesus appears to other groups after his resurrection. Neither the Bible nor the Urantia book mentions Mary Magdalene after Jesus' post-resurrection appearances, but apparently she continued her association with the women's corps and continued to minister to women. While there is no mention of Mary's later life in these two sources, she is prominently mentioned in a number of later works. In his book, Peter, Paul, and Mary Magdalene, Bart Ehrman says that Mary was mentioned in several of the Gnostic Nag Hammadi works and an earlier work, The Gospel of Mary. While we do not have reliable information about Mary Magdalene after Jesus' ascension, Bart Ehrman mentions that 3rd century author Origen said that Mary had followers devoted to her understanding of Jesus' message. It thus seems that Mary could be counted as an apostle, even though no one gave her the title. <laughs>